Hello, and welcome to today's Mind Your Career webinar program. My name is Sam Constance, and I work with the Alumni Career Programs team here at the University of Chicago. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar titled Uncommon Careers, a conversation with war photographer Jonathan Alpery. As I share a short intro to Jonathan's career, I'll cycle through some of his very powerful photos. Born in Paris in 1979, Jonathan moved to the United States in 1993. He graduated from the Lycée Français de New York in 1998 and went on to study medieval history at the University of Chicago, from which he graduated in 2003. Alpery started his career shooting for local Chicago newspapers during his undergraduate years. He shot his first photo essay in 2001 while traveling to the South Caucasus. Jonathan Alpery's career spans over a decade and has brought him to over 35 countries, covered 14 conflict zone assignments in the Middle East, North Africa, the South Caucasus, Europe, North Africa, or sorry, North America, and Central Asia. Um, a future photography book uh, about World War II is in the works, and Alpery published a book with Sh Simon and Schuster in October of 2017. Today, I will be moderating a series of questions in this conversation with Jonathan, but I know he's excited to answer questions from our audience members tuning in live. So please don't hesitate to submit your questions throughout the broadcast and we will save them for the end. Now, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Jonathan to kick this off. Welcome, Jonathan. Um, so to start things, would you mind sharing with our listeners uh, an introduction to your background and to your career? Yes, so like you mentioned, I went to Chicago as an undergrad, and uh, but I started my career as a photographer already when I was in college. Uh, my freshman year in college, I'd met with a, a local photographer who was pretty well known around Chicago called Lawrence Suntov, and he was living next to the campus. And um, I don't remember how we met, but I had already been taking pictures professionally, at least on a smaller scale. And he uh, allowed me to uh, to be his assistant for about a year and a half until I got fired for using his uh, his, his dark room a little too much. And but I did learn a lot from him, and that's how my career picked up into um, uh, decided to go uh, overseas and do international photography. Thank you. Um, so you've covered 14 wars in more than 35 countries. You've been um, held captive for 81 days. You've risked your life for your job. Can you elaborate on any one experience, if possible, um, that looking back led you to grow professionally? Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, it's, there are two facet, facets to this question. The first one is obviously the luck, luck faster in terms of um, factor, I'm sorry, in terms of how much you want to push yourself into risking your life to get the picture that you're looking for. Also, the kind of conflicts that you want to cover because some conflicts are much more brutal than others. For example, the war in Libya was softer than the war in Syria. The war in the Ukraine was different. Uh, they had, it, it was heavier fighting, but there was no kidnapping. So there are different um, things to worry about than to, that we in terms try to control your environment. That being said, uh, I, I remember once uh, making a decision. I used to cover the war in Nepal, and uh, I was in operations with the Nepalese army was fighting the rebels, the communist rebels there. This was back in 2005 early in my career. And uh, I had uh, was supposed to go on an operation to open up a road which had been cut by these rebels. There was some fighting going on, so I want to be in there and shoot it. And obviously, uh, I was supposed to be in a, that, a part of a convoy that ended up being ambushed and they were all killed and ended up being in a previous convoy. The, the, I'm sorry, the convoy right after was not ambushed. So I got the pictures, but I wasn't killed. So there's a lot of things like this that's happened over the past 18 years I've been doing this job, which, you know, have made me, uh, you know, you, you get some luck and sometimes you don't, but when you play with your life, it's sort of a, a one-time thing and so and I've been lucky, so. Thank you. For me sitting at my desk right now, that is, that's crazy to hear. Um, now, pivoting a little bit here, we'd love to hear about your background. And um, would you be able to elaborate on how you've put into practice skills or information, perhaps that you learned from your liberal arts education as a history major at the college? 
Of course, the, the, the main reason why I decided to become a photojournalist is because of the historical connotation to it. The main reason why the main interest that I've had since I was a teenager was history. And I remember I wrote two books on the Roman Empire uh, when I was a teenager, which made me a perfect candidate to being at UChicago as a big nerd around campus. So that was perfect for that. But um, it really, that historical connotation has shaped me completely also because a lot of family members were soldiers. They fought in all the big European wars in the 20th century, World War I, World War II, the war of Indochina and Nigeria. So I was brought up in that, bathed in that. So that was only natural for me to want to join history. And for me to join history, it had to be through war, which is a big component in uh, historical change. So obviously I studied history at UChicago. And I took all these historical, this passion, these elements, and I had to choose something that would connect from not only having an intellectual passion and to developing something that would be a career and a life, and, the, and photography was the link. Thank you. Um, something else that we've noticed is that formal or informal mentorships can have a really significant impact on career growth. Um, have you had any mentors to guide you through your experiences? And if so, how did you go about pursuing and sustaining a mentor relationship? Oh, that's interesting. Well, my father and my mother are two original, uh, let's say, genesis of that progress. Uh, when I was in Chicago, I had a great history teacher, Walter Kage. Uh, he died a couple of years ago, but I know he was a very famous historian. Early, uh, late, early Byzantine, early Muslim expansion period. So I think, you know, um, seven, eighth century. And uh, he did his entire career at U Chicago. His first job was at U Chicago, and he ended there. I think it was almost a 70, 65 uh, year career. And then there are other people you meet along the, the way in your life, people I met professionally, it's a couple of photographers who influenced me, of course, and people, uh, you know, some head of magazines like Elle Magazine, chief editor, Roberta Myers was a big um, component. And so there are people that you meet, uh, they're very few in number, which is good actually. And they were able to uh, not only direct me, or they opened doors for me and they made my career uh, more and more successful as the year progressed. So yeah, a few people. Thank you. Um, so what frustrations or anxieties um, did you have starting a career that many might consider uncommon or off the beaten path? Um, and then how did you overcome those hurdles, overcome those, those frustrations to get you where you are today? Uh, I've never, it's interesting because I've never felt competition from anybody. I'd never really try to measure myself towards anybody. A lot of people do, I, some people don't, and I'm one of these, these people. And the reason is uh, I've always been career driven. I mean, that's not original by itself, but I decided to be my own man. So I was, I've always been a contributor or freelance. So when I was shooting a lot for Vanity Fair, I was always negotiating contracts as a contributor, same for Elle Magazine or ABC or CNN or BBC or whatever big international uh, organizations I was working with. And the point is to be uh, completely self-made in the sense that you're your own boss. And for me, that was the most crucial aspect of, the, of it all. And uh, so I never really felt any pressure. I think the one pressure sometimes um, I have felt is uh, how much money you're making. And obviously that profession in some ways is dying out. So even guys like us have done very well professionally, it's getting harder and harder. So I've had to diversify I have other uh, two other careers that I deal with and it helps me financially tremendously, obviously. As being a, a, even a successful photojournalist today has become um, a close to impossible, in my opinion. Very few of us are left to be able to do that. And uh, so I would say that would, that would be the, the only element sometimes because it comes in a wave. Apart from that, not really. I've always been um, just making my own path. Thank you. Um, our next question is, there are many skills, logistics um, necessary to succeed in your profession outside of just being a great photographer. Um, what have you found to be the most important skill that you've developed as you've grown your business um, and, and honed your craft? Yeah, that's a crucial question. Taking pictures is probably 10% of your work when you go, when you cover international uh, current affairs. 
The reason is you need to organize the trip. It could be, you know, plane tickets, hotels, you know, that's normal. But the most important thing is that you need to develop the nice web of contacts around the world, not only from the editor's side, the magazines and newspapers and websites you work with or for, but the, the contacts you have on the ground. So the fixers and, uh, you know, whoever has some sort of pull and power in Syria or, uh, you know, South America, I've been covering the drug war down there. So I'm very well connected in Brazil, for example. And that takes time and takes people need to trust you. And that really it's 80% of everything. And plus the waiting, obviously, you know, you wait a lot, but you need to, to really uh, develop your skills in kinds of dealing with all kinds of people from all kinds of background, good people, bad people, normal people. And you need to be able to maneuver that and, and you need to make them feel that you're you you know you you're, you're trustworthy you, they need to be comfortable with you and these skills are life you know they can save your life often but when you even when you come home when you don't risk your life you can uh, they're applicable as well from going to the DMV I don't know from anything that's kind of mundane you uh, it's incredibly helpful and it's you know I've been doing this for a long time so it's it builds your character and it really changes you over time and perhaps a follow-up to that question, um, I can imagine that personal branding for you um, is a really important way of establishing and reinforcing who you are, what you stand for um, in your career and, and in your life. Can you share a little bit about your experience of building your professional brand? What advice do you have for fellow alumni who are looking to strengthen their own personal or professional brand? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, obviously, always be truthful. I think be your own, be your own person if you can. I think that's critical. I think also being straightforward with people. Most people want that. They don't. They're busy. They don't want people to sugarcoat it. Then they'll pick it up eventually, and that that doesn't really help you. So I think these are very important elements. Uh, I think that's. Uh, I wonder what else I could say about that. Um, it's uh, to, to build your own brand, it takes time. Some professions, it takes less time than others. And it's not all the same. There are all kinds of careers out there. But from my experience, you had to prove yourself. And to prove yourself in war, it's, you know, you have to be able to, to go to, to, you know, to get the contacts, get to a war zone and shoot it and shoot it well enough so it's quality work and then you bring it back. And that takes time for editors to trust you. So you can say, yeah, I'm going to, I don't know, I used to cover, uh, you know, cover, let's say all the riots in Egypt or in Tunisia doing the, what they, they call the Arab Spring. Um, and okay, so if young guys want to do it, you know, I've, ha I've already had years behind me. So for me, I already had all my editors, but for the young guys, they would have to go and they said, okay, go, you know, and be, but there are so many other people. And then you have to prove yourself that you can take good pictures and you can get the access that you need and come back with a body of work that's going to impress the editors and that takes time. Yeah, thank you. I agree that the, the authenticity piece is something that's just so vital um, when you're doing that. So um, our next question is, have you made a major pivot in your career at any point? And then how do you handle the uncertainty that comes with potential change like that? So I've uh, never really been Personally, not really scared of change. So uh, the kidnapping, so I was kidnapped for quite some time in Syria. And when I got out, uh, I met Jordi Bax, a um, very famous movie producer called Bonnie Timmerman in New York. And we were talking earlier about, you know, special people that you meet along the way in your life. And that's one of them. And, you know, this legendary ca character who's produced over 100 movies uh, in Hollywood is currently making a movie of my life. And the book was the came right before and now this and the documentary as well. That's in process. We have a major actor, I can't say who yet is gonna play my role. So there are all these things are happening. And that happened by pure luck. And um, the other thing that I've been doing less in terms of luck, but more consistently is I've been doing a lot of uh, public speaking, uh, crisis management, talk about geopolitics in Europe, Islam, all kinds of things. So. When you have this experience of going to all these war zones, there are different opportunities that do open up and then you have to grab them. Um, but not only, you know, people are interested to, you know, either it's corporate or campuses uh, will uh, pay and hire, and hire me to speak publicly. 
because I'm still I'm still very active in the field. I'm still doing it, and I'm still able to talk about it, and that still evolves, and that makes it interesting. So that's a, it's a good way to uh, to you know expand on your career and add different um, kind of like I see as a, a puzzle, which has different pieces, and you add a piece and another piece, and then you have something more complete. And uh, the public speaking has been definitely something that's been helpful in that sense. We might have to have a UChicago alumni screening of your movie when it comes yeah. out. <laughs> um, so maybe following up to that, in 2017, uh, you published a book titled The Shattered Lens, A War Photographer's True Story of Captivity and Survival in Syria. Can you describe the process of writing that memoir, revisiting what are potentially some of your life's most difficult experiences? So writing a book, uh, for, it was very cathartic. Uh, some people like to see a psychiatrist. Uh, for me, it was more the writing aspect. And also, I spoke a lot with my parents or people very close to me. So that was a, a nice way to uh, evacuate some issues. So writing the book is also very visual because you have to, in great detail, remember, and also in a very realistic way, what had happened from the tortures, from the mock execution, the fighting, uh, you know, bombings, whatnot, all these things that were happening. And that was uh, that was very helpful to, to evacuate a lot of these things. One thing that helped me as well is a few months after I was released from Syria, the war in the Ukraine started and I went, I packed my bags. The buddy of mine I met in Paris and we flew to Kiev and we went to the war zone and I covered that war for two years. Until then, I was badly injured, and I took kind of a year off from covering these kinds of uh, stories. And the one thing that was cathartic, and I know it's straying a little bit from the book, but the one thing that was cathartic about it is since I was kidnapped at a checkpoint um, and where we were roaming around covering, uh, you know, firefights, whatever was happening in Ukraine, I was driving and I had a fixer and two buddies of mine, photographers that were sitting in the back usually. And every time we, I don't know, maybe 20 times a day, at least we go through from one checkpoint to another, either pro-Ukrainian or pro-Russian side. And for me in the beginning, it was quite hard psychologically. It made me nervous because that's how I went. I was kidnapped. But after doing this constantly and forcing myself to do it, it's sort of like you're afraid of flying, but you keep doing it, you know, so you get used to it eventually. And that was also very cathartic. So that's one aspect that not just the book, but also forcing myself to go through these checkpoints over and over to um, to go over this. Thank you. Um, you've been faced with some difficult decisions about pursuing potentially very dangerous assignments. What has your experience taught you about making tough choices, evaluating the best course of action, um, and moving forward appropriately? Uh, when it comes to covering wars, uh, you know, they'll always tell you no pictures worth your life. Obviously, that's true. But so you have to find it within yourself. No one can teach you that. Uh, how far you can push the envelope, how much if there's very heavy fighting, you just take cover and hide and just wait it out. And everybody would understand. No one's going to make fun of you for that. Or you're just going to go all the way. Like some guys that I know will just become soldiers and just bathe themselves in this bullets flying or whatever's happening at the time for me uh it depends i've been a bit more um in that crazy group of people that we are that we who do this for a living and maybe uh, uh, sometimes i've gone really far and other times i've just decided not to do it depending on how i felt um following my you know gut feeling so it's been a big proponent of that um i remember Syria was always a tough decision. It was a scary war to cover, not just because of the fighting, but also because of the kidnapping issues that I knew even before it happened to me, because I was there on my third assignment. And you have to, no one can, like I said, no one can teach you how to be, it's kind of like being a soldier, you know, you, you're about to um, receive your baptism of fire and no officers next to you or your buddies can really help you truly. You have to find it within yourself to see. And it's really the only true way to find out if this is in you or not. As a photojournalist or a war reporter, if it's not for you, you can always say, I'm going to do something else and shoot celebrities, whatever. As a soldier, obviously, you sign up and you're stuck. But um, so that's, uh, I think that's an important element to understand 
uh, that at the end you have to find the strength within you. Yeah, it's something we we all can work on um, in our own ways, and and I think your advice to follow your gut is always really important. Um, we have gotten a lot of questions in from our audience here, so I'm gonna just gonna final or make this this last final question from the University of Chicago, and then we'll we'll pivot to audience questions. Um, so you have followed your passion quite literally around the world. Um, do you have just some general advice for alumni who are considering an uncommon career um, and who need to just dive in? Yeah, you know, this question is tricky because, you know, I'm European, so I'm old school and we have a very different school of thought when it comes to this in the U.S. where I tell follow your dreams, do what you want. As a European, we're a little bit more practical, I think, when it comes to that, if I may say. Maybe that's the fact that we're a very old nation and go through so much. We're just old in our minds. But uh, yes, you, you know, you choose what you want to choose. That's that's your business, and that's the, the greatness of living in the U.S. It's free. You want to be a plumber, you want to be a plumber, you want to be a politician, whatever. That's that's your problem. That's that, and that's the good thing. Uh, obviously, I would add, add a little co um, parenthesis to it in the sense that, uh, like we say in the US, life throws you curveballs all the time and you have to readjust. And uh, I know a photographer, not personally, but you know, by name, he had a pretty well known guy. He was a very active war photographer and he lost both of his legs in Afghanistan. I think he was Portuguese or Brazilian, I forget. Anyway. So if it that had not happened, he would continue to follow his path, which was war photography. That's no longer possible. And then he had to readjust and do other kinds of photography. So my, my, uh, I don't really have an advice except to say that things like this happen. Of course, I'm taking a very extreme example. Could be a child, you know, you, you, uh, you get, uh, you know, you get married and you have children, and that's it. You know, you have to to readjust your life. That's the way it is. And you have to be very, um, very practical about that. And um, so, uh, I mean, there are uncommon careers. There are a few. Uh, I always say, you know, I'm asked that question a lot. And you know, if you want to be, uh, you could be something typic more typical. That's you know, difficult, a lawyer or a doctor or a businessman, stuff like that. Or if you want to do something that's um, that's much more uncommon that you have to assume that the risks are might be higher because it's a looser organization and um, you might be more on your own. So you have to really decide if you're that kind of person. You could say, I want to be an artist. Okay, you know, everybody, it, there are many artists. Um, are you going to be able to make a living on that? Most likely not. You want to be an actor or an actress. Your chances are quite slim. You can still try it, but you have to keep that in mind. Therefore, having a plan B, I think, is crucial. Yeah, thank you. And in this world of uh, of uncertainty following COVID-19, I feel like we're all navigating this this very unique place where we're trying to to act on that that same advice that you're giving right now. Um, so, like I mentioned, we've got a lot of questions from the audience here. So I'm just going to jump in with some of them. Um, one here, how do you counteract the emotional toll of the experiences that you witness or that you've had? How do you feel that it's important, or do you feel that it's important to be dispassionate as you report, or do you prefer to explore your point of view to either confirm your perspective or refute what you originally believed? Great so question. it's a very important question. Uh, number one, when you do this profession, let's say reporting in general, it's not about you. It's about the story. I don't like journalism that puts forward journalists. I think that's wrong. I think it's uh, write a book. I don't know, but it's not about you. It's you need to be behind the camera. It's about the subjects that you're that you're covering. That's number one. Number two, when it comes to the psychology of it, everybody is a bit different in terms of degrees. Oh, it's not. So you have people who are uh, very uh, emotional. I highly recommend them not to do these kinds of jobs. Or, not make it out psychologically it's too difficult and then you have guys who are in terms of degrees less and less in terms of um, being able to take it on their shoulders what they see and what they experience and for me my my level of resilience is very high i've seen a lot of terrible things um, over the years and when you come home you have to sort of let that behind you of course that's not entirely possible obviously 
and it chips away always. There's always a consequence of seeing dead kids in Mosul and Iraq. And I used to cover that siege in 2017. Now it's hard to see these kids getting picked up by picked off by snipers. And but when you come home, I don't really talk about it, or very few, or not in great detail. Like right now, I mean, this is, it's I, I don't, you know, pan on it, pan out on it. But um, you have to also again find this within, find it within yourself. If you're the kind of person who's going to just emotionally just be crushed by it, then you should just have a more regular life. Otherwise, you know, people commit suicide. You know, people cannot make it. So you have to really know yourself. And if you don't know yourself, you can go and find out, but then you have to be strong enough to retract yourself and just say, well, this wasn't for me and be smart enough like I tried. It's not for me. I'll be doing something else and that's okay. And not feel regret out of it. Yeah, take some serious self-awareness to, to to make sure that this is the right career for you. Yeah. Um, so we've had a, a number of questions about building relationships. So how do you make contacts in war zones? What does building relationships look like um, when you're in a new place? How do you make a network of connections uh, somewhere that you've never worked before? So that's a very broad question. Uh, it First of all, I would start by saying it depends where where in the world you're working. If you're working in Africa, I did a lot of conflicts in East Africa, like Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya. So I did. I started my career actually when I was working for Getty Images. I was shooting wars in East Africa, and uh, when you're there, you have to learn to be patient. Africans, are, you know, actually from the entire continent, is a, a common thread there. What you, you know, things are looser. It's not like the Germans, just for an extreme example. And um, if you're too impatient and you press them too hard, you're definitely not going to get what you want. And I had to learn that the hard way, you know, New York, you know, you know how we are, everything needs to happen quickly. You have to retract and relearn to just maybe take a week and just hang out with them, you know, maybe you don't, you can't take pictures, you just don't take pictures and you have to, them to trust you. And that's fundamental. And also, you need to be very malleable, and you need to be able to to change, you know, because then maybe you'll be covering something in Mexico, and it's different there. You cover the drug war, you go to, you go cover something in Syria, or I remember covering in Turkey, or these guys, and there all these are different elements. So you need to readjust yourself every time, and uh, and just and also being very low key always, and just very quiet. Not too quiet. Now people might think you're you're a spy or something, but be you know just just being uh, just be yourself in a how should I say in a more um, discreet sense. You see a lot of journalists. I remember in, and there was some fight battle going on in Libya, and these CNN reporters and they were screaming at some of the rebels because they didn't get access. I would never do that, and they didn't get what they wanted. They were kicked out actually. They're idiots. So you have to just sort of, you know, play along and then just, and then you'll get what you want. So that patience, I think, pays off tremendously. And in the Western world, we forgot about that. And actually, as a follow up to that, we did have a question about, um, about patience, about waiting. Um, you, you've mentioned it a few times during this presentation here. So do you have any words of wisdom on productive patience versus just twiddling your thumbs? Yeah, well, let's say, I, I guess I'll speak from my experience. You're in an area and you want to cover something and you're with a group and they still maybe don't trust you yet very much. So you need to spend time with them. And in a way to, I mean, you might get bored, you know, that's the least of your problems really. But you at least spend time, you know, get to know them and for them to to know you. At least you're, you're it, that's work. You're working you, because the end game is the photos you want to take. And um, I think that's very important. So you're not really wasting time. And if you're just lying there and doing nothing in your own corner, then that's wasting time because they're, you need to build a relationship with these people. And they understand, they're not stupid. They understand you want something, which is that photo, that footage. And they might want something back from you too, which is maybe, uh, I used to be very popular in all the rebel groups in East Ethiopia. And for them to have an international photographer come in and cover wars on their side was a great PR move for them. 
And I, I knew that they knew that we didn't have to tell that to each other. We just knew about it. And and with that great PR, they would I would get access to everything I wanted and get and I was shooting for the BBC at the time and I would get the photos and bring them back. So it was a compromise. So you're never really wasting time. Looking to find those uh, mutually beneficial experiences whenever possible. Um, we've got a special question in for you here, Jonathan, um, from Sarah, your first year RA, actually. She's tuning in here. Um, her question is, is there anything that you want to shoot or do that you haven't done yet? That's uh, a good question. Um, maybe I should have shot more our freshman year at Burton Judson's. Anyway, uh, I don't know. I don't really, well, actually, I'm working on a big, a uh, big project. Uh, well, right now it's been cut short because I've been covering the coronavirus in New York the past six weeks. So I'm just focusing on that for my clients. But uh, I've been uh, slowly but surely building a, a very wide photo essay story on the drug war in South America. And before the virus happened, I was flying again back to Brazil to cover uh, Bolivia and Paraguay and just have some sort of a big body of work. So that's my main medium term focus photographically right now. And you mentioned this, so so I'm going to bring it up. We're living in this really unique historical moment right now with the coronavirus. Can you speak to um, the experiences that you've had um, working, shooting, and, and living during this really unprecedented time? So uh, obviously for guys like us, this is um, a, a very opportune time uh, because it's historical. And this happens once every, I think it's every 40, 60 years, there's something of that nature, if it happens naturally, and then, you know. But uh, so for me, of course, professionally and photographically, it's it's very interesting. It's a very different kind of feel, different kind of story, and you know, no one has ever seen New York like that ever. It's been almost six weeks now. So usually, you know, I, I uh, so I don't shoot every day. I shoot about five days a week. I need to rest, you know, I need my immune system to be healthy. I don't want to be too tired in case I get the virus and I'm going to fight it off pretty quick, well enough. I go out, I walk a lot, maybe 10, 15 miles a day. So I'm, um, uh, now my feet are hurting. I'm 41, maybe that's why. And um, yeah, I'm just doing, just going around. Yesterday I was in Brooklyn doing a story on the Orthodox Jews. They've been losing a lot of people. So... I've been shooting around there and started the story a few weeks ago in Manhattan. So I'm getting a pretty big body of work on how the city is coping with the situation, the hospital, so on and so forth. So it's, um, and then I come home, I wash all my clothes, I, I alcohol, everything. So I just kind of try to kill if there's virus on any of the surfaces. So I have a, some sort of a, a very detailed plan when I get home. I don't walk with my shoes. I just take my clothes off, I take a shower, so and then I wash everything. And I do that every day, so I don't uh, I don't bring it home. So sort of a routine. Yeah, it's important to have a routine. Um, yeah. All right, we have a, a few more questions here. Let's see. Um, so financially, was it difficult at the beginning of your career to, to navigate this world? And how did you manage to navigate these challenges? And perhaps did it ever make you consider more of a traditional career path? Yeah. Uh, so the, the the money side of photojournalism is terrible now. Now I'm still doing well because uh, I have very good contacts and I've been doing this for a long time and I'm well respected in my profession. So I have, but it, you know, I've been doing this for 18 years, so I have quite a bit of years behind me. Um, it goes in waves. Sometimes it's terrible. Sometimes it's good, but it's getting worse and worse because newspapers, magazines, no one has money anymore. I think everybody knows that. I'm not uh, learn. I'm not, you know, you, no one's learning anything new from what I'm saying. So uh, now, when you have something like the coronavirus, you do well because, you know, I think I've must have made over 50 uh, international publications so far. And, but that's because I have all these this this web of contacts that I've described early on. When you're just starting, it's tough because you're competing against guys like me. But even guys like me are competing against uh, people with cell phones, iPhones, and easy technologies that you can use. And uh, sometimes the media, they don't want to pay for high-end professionals or more expensive, and they'll just get 
something that's cheaper, they'll work a deal with an agency that will tell them, if you give me 5,000 a month, you get all the photos you want and the royalties back to the photographers is minimal. So that's just a business model that's really hurting photographers. Um, and it's too bad because the quality is so great. There's really great stuff out there everywhere. And I will add another thing on that question is, um, I don't know if there's any photographers who are listening, who people want to become. Instagram is not uh, a helpful tool in the sense that you cannot build a career as an Instagram photographer. It has never happened and never will. Especially now you have more and more people. It could be a nice component, just an add up that you can, you can add to your career. That can help you a little bit, but not really. I mean, it's not fundamental. And it's sad because there's there are great there's great stuff out there, but there's so much that it gets drowned in everything else, and uh, and it needs to be forgotten really quickly. So you really need to be a little bit traditional about your career approach, and you still need to be out there and create great quality work. And you know I still know the editors and the magazines and the newspapers and the websites and so on um, to be noticed. Instagram is just a another another element you can add. That's all. Thank you. So our next question uh, from the audience is, have you ever experienced a situation in which the story that you've discovered and that you felt needed to be shared was actually declined by your client because they had a different objective for the coverage? And, and how do you handle that? Yeah, this happens all the time. Uh, for example, uh, so last year, I'll give you a, a concrete example. Last year, I spent three months in Brazil, uh, a month and a half, a month and a half, covering drug war. The first time I went, which was in um, May and June last year, and I did very well. I, did, I had a lot of coverage, it did really well. The second time I uh, went in September, October of last year, I maybe did half of the number of publications. And the reason is timing. Timing is everything uh, for all professions actually, but for mine specifically, because you could be covering something and there's no major news cycle. But uh, I, um, in 2016, I followed Trump for five weeks on the election trail to for a French agency called CEPA in Paris. So obviously we did very well because I covered, I, knew, I mean, personally, I knew he was going to win. So I, all the other photographers went to cover Hillary Clinton and didn't get that final day for the victory day, and I did. So since he won, the media has been particularly um, almost obsessed to cover him constantly, for, you know, everything, whatever he does, which actually hurts other guys, you know, like me, for example, don't, I don't cover news, really. I do more photo essays, or usually. And when you cover other big stories like drug wars or, you know, things that are really significant in this world, it does get, it could get sidelined because um, uh, there's a, a a focus on the, the Trump thing. And my editors at Vanity Fair is a perfect example. I used to work a lot for them and now barely is because they are doing a lot of their reporting on, on Donald Trump, all negative. And uh, and I used to cover wars for Vanity Fair. I used to do like serious, heavy stuff. And that's all being turned down now because uh, they're just focusing, putting all their resources on it. And they're making a serious mistake. And I'm not saying that because it's I'm living this personally. But because people want to read, they, you know, you have to hopefully assume that people are smart and they want to know about a lot of things and you want to nurture their their curiosity. And if you're just going to one subject all the time, it's boring. And as a matter of fact, their their sales are collapsing and fewer and fewer people are reading Vanity Fair partially for that reason. It does feel like we're in a moment where we're being just inundated with uh, with politics. I think you're exactly yeah. right. We do have a question now coming from someone who I have to assume is a parent because they they ask, what did your parents think about this career choice? <laughs> uh, well, my, my parents, uh, they, you know, they, whatever I wanted to do in life, they, they let me do it. So there was never an issue there. Now they're for the past couple, especially after the Syria chapter, uh, they were uh, hoping I would settle down and have kids and get married. Um, I mean, I do want to have kids eventually uh, married. I'm not so sure, but uh, so but they're hoping this will happen sooner than later. 
and they know my career is a bit in the way for that. So uh, they have been on my case about this on a regular basis, my sister, kind of everybody in the family at this point, including my close friends. So You're just getting it from all friends. That's not yeah, fair. Yeah, <laughs> um, all right, we'll probably go with about two more questions here because I know I've been peppering you quite a bit. Jonathan, we appreciate your time. Um, the, the second to last question we've got here is with changing times that impact professional photography, how are you differentiating your work from that of others? How are you setting yourself apart? How are you handling that? Very interesting question. When you, when you create, I, get, I, I don't consider myself as an artist, but you could consider photography as art. Um, you are always influenced by someone else. You, you never truly take like music or cinematography. You always have an an influence from something and you develop from it and you build another branch from it. So that's that's normal. Very, very few people have been able to just be the first in something ever and then be creating something out of it. Um, so it's a tough question. I think um, it's uh, some, maybe some stories I've covered. I, I remember everybody went to Iraq uh, in 2003, five, four, five, six, and and from 2002 to 2009, I mostly covered wars in Africa, which no one really cares about usually, unless you have something major, which is not common. And they're very expensive trips, and they're hard to get to. It's it's you know financially it's tough to to deal with. And um, so I made my name uh, covering the kind of wars that no one was really covering. I did not go to Iraq. The only time I went to Iraq is in 2017, and I was covering Mosul. And I went to Afghanistan, and I only did it once in 2010 with the French Foreign Legion. So I tried to be to do something a little different. And if you can afford to do it, and you have the means and the, the resources, then do it. Otherwise, I mean, you know, many guys in New York are taking pictures of the coronavirus, but not so many of us are actually getting published extensively. And uh, and that's because, like I said before, you have this this war machine behind of all these editors and people that know you. Uh, so if you want to stick or if you want to be different, you know, you have to be better artistically, just something very creative. You have to look for something that something that hasn't been done. Um, maybe it's a portrait of people living in a, in a, in a project. This has, hasn't been done. Just that's, you know, living on the coronavirus. I mean, there are many, you have to think of, a, of an example of an idea. The ideas are there, you just have to find them. Thank you. Yeah, something that we, we all work on, right, is setting ourselves yeah. apart and, and finding a unique and creative angle to the work that we do. Um, and then our final question, how do you go about connecting with your photography subjects on a cross-cultural level? I know you've mentioned several groups that you've had rapport and connections with, but how do you establish that rapport? How do you keep it? Um, and do you stay in touch with them after you've left? Well, I operate usually, is I don't just go right away, take pictures and get in their faces. I just try to take my time, pretty discreet and try to disappear in the background really and then just start doing your work. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, yeah, establishing rapport and then building cross-cultural relationships. Um, and if, if you could speak to that. Yeah, I've never really had a, a, an issue with that. From very early age, I was able to travel, to travel, um, uh, you know, very, uh, very easily. So I was able to, um, to uh, to get used to all different kinds of uh, of nationalities and people, so it was never a problem for me. Here, can can you hold on one second? Yeah, no problem at all. And actually, um, that will bring us to the, the the end of our presentation here. I do um, want to thank Jonathan so much for giving us a window into his unique, his fascinating story. Um, so our program continues, as you can see on the screen here, next Wednesday, yeah. April 22nd, with a webinar titled Navigating the First 90 Days of a New Job. Yeah. And this webinar will give you 10 ways that you can navigate the first 90 days of your new job, make your mark as an employee. Um, and that, I think, is becoming even more important during this economic climate with anxiety that you might feel starting a new job remotely. 
You can also visit our events page at careers.uchicagoalumni.org for a full list of our upcoming programs. Um, Jonathan, I want to thank you so much for thank taking you. the time to answer the many, many questions that we have and for you today. If I may, number one, uh, I'm sorry, I had to leave. That was the mailman. And when they come, you have to make sure they deliver because then they never come back right now. Uh, no if problem. There's, if there's anyone that's listening and they want to reach out to me, they have any questions, I will help them out. It would be my pleasure. So they can easily find me on the internet, or email me, and I will try to do my best. That is great. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, and to everyone tuning in, take care and have a great rest of your day.